So, uh, yes, as I said, we're, we're, we're a bit strange um, <laughs> as lecturers. But, um, okay, so, code review. Now, um, I'll, yeah, now, can I mute you? Oh, I think you just did mute. Excellent. Um, so, one of the <coughs> important things for you guys to do with us and to do with each other is to show us your code while it's in development. Um, and this is because we're not just interested in helping you at the end of the process, we're interested in helping you through the process. Um, and so it's, it's emotionally traumatizing, potentially, to show off code you know is a bit, and you know doesn't look too good and has bad bits in it, right? Um, however, it's really important to be willing to show us that code, right? You need to be able to stump up and, and say, look, okay, this is what I currently, I know it's not working, I know it's not pretty, but okay, can we get some feet? Um, and when you do a code review, so when you come into the room, you've got your code up on the projector and you're looking through it, it's important to know why you're doing that review, right? So uh, it's usually not um, checking to see if you've got, you pick the right size font for your code environment, or you know that you um, have the the file the right length of things, right? It's usually we're we're talking about are we are we doing is it working code and we're looking for potential errors? Are we looking at it for a quality of the code? As in, is this well written? Do we understand what it's doing? Um, are we doing a code review so that we can integrate with other code, right? So we're actually look, reviewing it and measuring it against the standards of other code that we uh, And we also have to know, is this reusable code or one-time code? One-time code, you don't need to put a lot of that effort into making it reusable, you just use it as it is. Um, and so when we come to do code reviews, it's very important to understand why you're doing code. Uh, you also want to automate the code reviews as much as possible. Um, now, I mean, with with uh, the, the code reviews, um, it is best to do that code, uh, with code that you've actually developed, and that's what we expect to do in some of the sprints, is to look at your code and give you code reviews on it. Um, we also expect you to automate some of this, because, you know, um, there's only a limited amount of resources that we have, and so we can't do everything all the time. Uh, so the idea is that we can use static analysis of your code quality. So some of you will have used linters um, potentially in the past to check is the syntax correct and you know have you made sure that you've got the right equal sign on if statements and those sort of things, right so there are there are ways that that the program that we can get the software the the, the computer to check some of the standard things people get wrong um, now with using a version control tool you can then integrate that checking into the version control tool. Uh, and so this gets into when we do continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, and so in GitLab, you'll see there's a CICD um, in our GitLab environment. And if I just bring up an example of that and go our um, dot g. Yeah, it's frozen. Okay, it is. Um, so I'm just bringing up that GitLab example. So um, in GitLab, uh, we have over here the um, down this right hand side. If I make it, oh, left hand side rather. Uh, we have what just has appeared now the little rocket ship, which is the continuous integration and continuous deployment. Um, and so that is an area where you create and run pipelines and, and we call and, and we talk about web hooks, right? So here I talk about Linter, there's a continuous integration. Uh, hi, hi Sam, your, yes, your, fro your screen froze. Oh, my screen froze. Okay. Um, right. Uh, let's see. So you're not seeing that moving? No, we, we're seeing uh, automate as much as possible slide and your camera is not moving and nothing is changing on the slide show that we see. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll try turning off my camera, turning back on my camera, then turning on slide share and going share. 
Did that change anything? Yep, we see your screen now. Okay. And we see your mouse moving, so yes. it's it's going now. Um, yep. Excellent. Um, so here we're talking um, this this idea of CI/CD um, is that when you make commits uh, in GitLab here, it has um, pipelines and jobs that it will run, uh, and so the idea is that that um, you can set up your aggression tests and have them all run automatically. Uh, now, uh, the, the simplest continuous integration is that to use uh, get their pages and have it create web pages for um, some of the, the, or a web page for some of the project. You can also have it hit any URL, so, yeah, or send emails, right? So when you commit, it sends an email. Say, oh, right? Uh, or something's been updated on us. So there are various ways that you can automate both notifications of, of what's happened and testing of your code, both static testing for the code quality as well as regression and integration testing. Uh, and so during the course of the semester, uh, we, we would like to see you starting to play with some of the web hooks and the continuous integration so that you can demonstrate this understanding of automation. Okay. Um, so if I go back to my slides and I make that bit, see me again? Yay. Um, okay, so we want to automate as much as possible. Now, there are, you can use so Cloud um, and SonarQ are, are ways to do some of those, uh, some of that automation. Um, now, those static checkers uh, can find quite a lot there. So you still have to have individuals, and you still have to do some manual code check. And so when you're going to do manual code check, <laughs> there are some tips that we have. Uh, if you're going to check just uh, lines of code, don't try try not to do more than 400 lines of code, right? Um, because if you're doing a good review, then you don't want to get tired in this thing. You want to be fresh, you want to have it, have it being the most relevant bits. Um, try not, don't do it for more than an hour, again, you get tired doing this. Um, and you've got to kind of get your head into the code, so you don't want to do it for less than 10 minutes or more than, than an hour. Um, set goals, what are you trying to achieve? Why are you doing this, as I said? Capture metrics. So. Every time you find a bug or every time you fix it, it's actually really useful to note that down. Um, partly because at the end of a code review, sometimes it feels like, you know, we didn't really achieve much, did we? Um, because it, you don't feel like you're adding new features to the code, feel like the, the project getting better. But by noting down bugs that you found, or things that you would, you would update or do differently next time, um, those all create a record of this kind of process that we're going. So the idea is to, to note things down and keep a record. Um, you can annotate the code itself as those. Um, you might want to say, oh, um, this code has to come back and has to go through another once. Right? So you actually don't just say, I'll fix it. You say, is this, we know you're going to have to fix it. We know how you're going to fix, fix it, or is it a this is this is challenging. You've got to do quite a lot of changes, so we want to before we approve it. Uh, and this comes back to the idea of done. I don't know if, if uh, Deputy and Mario should talk to you about um, when when code is finished and when you can describe a task as done. Uh, some people say done when it compiled, uh, which is generally not considered the right kind, um, because just because something compiles doesn't mean it part the test or passes version tests or completes all the functionality you right? So, so you need to define what done is. And so part of the review is also saying, well, are we done with this code, right? Is it stable, is it tested, is it, is it finished? Um, it's also useful if you're in a new code to potentially come up with a little checklist of things you want to look because often when you're doing a review, you see things that are there. But it's very hard to see the things that aren't there unless you know to look for them. Right? And so there's this like, like just coming in um, and cold and just looking at the code and going, um, oh, yeah, no, it all looks good. But there's some 
massive thing you've missed because you didn't have that sort of checklist to say, what do I expect to see in the Kodan, in this, this, this project? Um, we want to have a relatively positive culture at youth, and we want to also have both both formal reviews and some lightweight. You should be you should be looking at each other's code, not as a heavyweight review we are actually going to, but just as a poke your head over the shoulder and go, oh, that's an interesting way of doing that, or, or okay, you know, I can see what you're doing. Um, just so you keep integrated with each other and you know what's going on. Um, and so those those can be quite easy. And the last thing is security review. Now, um, some of you are, are not from Europe, and so uh, you're coming into the GDPR zone. Um, and the idea of a security review to audit how you deal with um, the, the privacy and security of data in your system. Um, part of the GDPR data handling security issue is, is merely that you had meetings to discuss security. So just documenting the review process is part of the requirement for GDP uh, for privacy and, and handling of data. Uh, and if you're handling sensitive data, you need auditor. Now, we're not going to get you guys to keep either sensitive data or require an external But this idea of, of auditing and reviewing and logging what you do is becoming more and more critical uh, financially as the the stick that Europe has to beat you with for GPR is quite a big one at 20 million euro infringement. So um, you don't you don't want to fall foul of that. Uh, and getting used to this idea of of checking uh, privacy and checking um, authentication and how you deal with that and who you share the data with, knowing that that's something you have to do from day one in your system is important. Um, also, refactoring code. Um, so code, recu uh, code reviews can lead to saying, well, okay, no, you know, this file is this this um, class is having to deal with too much, too many connections between it and other files, or it's not cohesive, like this part of the, the class does this thing and this part does a completely different thing and never uh, it makes no sense that they're in the same place. Um, and at that point, you then enter that code um, review stage. Uh, there's also a, a term, technical debt. How many of you have used the term tech debt? And do you know what technical debt means? So how many of you used technical debt? Okay, we're... Obviously, got back to our buffering slow. Maybe because I'm not getting audio, um, it's a little bit slow. Okay, so so um, Mario seems to know what. So the idea of technical debt is when you're coding, often you'll make little wee tiny decisions of oh, you know, I'll 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 just put in a magic number later, right? Is I know that this should be a variable, and I should public, and I know I should serialize it so that it can be accessed by the GUI. And the, you know, there's stuff I know I should, but I'll just put the number of ten. I'll fix it. Right? And the, you know, oh, there's three of these things. I should probably make an array because there might be more of them. But I'll just call them, you know, um, uh, button one, button two, and button three. I won't make an array one and just give it a name. Button to it. And I'll fix it in there, right? Because, like, I know it's not the right way of doing it, but I just copy and paste them on the fastest way. I'll just do that then. Um, technically, whenever you do those kind of all hack arounds that just get something working right now, we call that technical debt. It is a debt that will need to be paid because you are doing something, hey, get the prototype working, or get this, the job done by the Friday to show the client, and you're leaving things undone that should have been. And so that's why we call it debt. And the idea of, of paying down debt is that you're no longer adding functionality, you're no longer adding new things to the code, you are paying off the stuff that you've already built up, you're paying back debt that you've already put into the, the code base. Um, and this idea of, of 
of technical debt is actually a really challenging one in, in industry well, because project managers and customers who don't understand technical debt, right? They don't understand this concept that, yes, I know it's working, but it's Fred, if I touch anything, the whole system's going to break. If you want me to add anything, I it would take just forever to add anything. It's got lots of, of little fine problems in there. That would be a, a, a project that had massive tech debt. Um, and so, as professionals, you start. You need to understand that aspect of of, um, of your code review to to find tech debt and say, well, yes, that stuff needs to be fixed and needs to be fixed now. And you need to create an issue in your tracker that says fixing technical debt for this function so that you can then say why you're changing code, right? So you have to get that flow working. Okay, so um, the, the last part, because we uh, design pack now, I don't know, do you have all of you used coding design pack? I don't know what your education is about. So who, who has used code design pack? Okay. And who hasn't heard of design patterns for code? Okay, so most of you are the, the um, having used them before. Some of you, I can't see anyone who says that. Um, so my thought was I'll just quickly skip through some of this, and we can we can talk a little bit about um, because like, so. So design patterns are not just, you know, let's say doing stuff so you can do it so we can kind of go, oh yes, I'm doing what the lecturer said. Um, and hopefully there's also some disagreements. Now I've got Mario here uh, who um, will will have some disagreements about anti-pattern discussion of like what's a good pattern versus a bad pattern. Right? So it's, it's, it, it isn't a clear defined set of things we know to be true. Um, there are some times when you might want to to say, well, that's I know that's how it used to be done, but that's not how we should do it now. So uh, if we look at, at the idea, um, part of them is that these are solutions that we've already created. But the other part of it is they're a way of communicating to other programs. Um, what I want you to think about as software engineers is that your code isn't just a solution to a problem. It's also part of the way that you communicate to other programs. And by using design patterns, you're using a, a known format, and so it becomes much easier to communicate. So, for example, we force you during the your master to use the, the inbred structure, so the introduction, methodology, results, and discussion, right? So this idea that there's a, a formal structure to essay. You probably had essay before, you know, Introduction, mid conclusion, you know, you've got a structure of essays that you write. Um, now, that's not just because we love structure, it's because it's partly to help communicate so we can quickly understand what's going on, right? That we don't have to search for the, um, the, the reason you're doing something because it's in the interact. So, design patterns are actually not just that they are. The, it's not that they're necessarily the best way of doing something. They might be the best way of communicating what your intent is. Um, and uh, this becomes quite interesting when we start talking about what code to use, when and why and where. So if we look at design patterns, we, I, I tend to break them down to programming patterns and user. Right? So there's a whole bunch of user based patterns. We're not going to talk about all of the design usability patterns, but you should go and have a look at those if you're wanting to communicate with users and you want to communicate programmers about them, so they're quite easy. As programmers, um, if you look at, these are the kind of ones that, that I've used the most often in music. So command patterns, flyweight patterns, singleton patterns, strategy patterns, factory patterns, spatial patterns, composite patterns, right? That's the idea of the way that you do each of them. Um, so if we look at the command pattern, um, the, you, when we, we talk about a design pattern, we are thinking, what's the problem? What would you normally do, and how does the design pattern do it differently to what like a novice programmer might just whack in a sort? Um, because if, if any novice would automatically use the design, it doesn't really need to be there, because it's the obvious, naive way of doing it. So it's kind of only interesting when it isn't the naive way of doing it. So, 
So we, with the command pattern, we say, well, we're trying to remap a function call. Right? So we've got these functions that we want to be able to kind of use function for. Um, and here, the command pattern is the idea you turn functions into full object, you replace and replace callbacks with objects, right? So so for OO languages, rather than you, rather than function pointers, you use fully fledged objects, you turn functions into objects and then you attach objects to them, right? So so the functions go around as as full. Uh, and so that's a that's a way of saying well, we won't use kind of functional approaches that you can do in C. We'll take a more consistent OO approach and use the command pattern that we have these commands. So the flyway pattern is the idea that that um, if you have many, many objects that are very rather than just creating a mass of all of the objects with all of their code and all of their data all to get, you create two types of object. You create the, the heavyweight object that has everything about itself and a bunch of flyweights only contain the barest amount of information that's needed. So for example, if you were looking at a forest, you could have the, the heavyweight solution is each tree is its own object with its own mesh um, and its, its own kind of information about bark and its leaves and where it is and how big it is. Okay? Um, in the flyweight pattern model, what you do is see like, where it is in the ground and how big those are. Tree, but everything else will just make them the same tree. Okay? So we have this heavyweight object with all the bones and these flyweights and lightweights. Right? Now, this way of that way of solving it is a consistent way that other people understand. So it's clear what you're doing when you use a flight pack. Uh, that they say, oh, okay, so this is the this is the model, and these are those, those tiny ones. You also see this as an example of, of some of the um, particle systems, right? Where where you have the description of what a particle is, and then you have a whole bunch of flyweights, which are the individual, the barest amount of information, because with a particle system, you can have a lot of cargo you, you need to save space. Um, the singleton pattern, uh, hopefully you, um, many of you will have used the singleton pattern. So the singleton pattern is you like that, um, we used to use global variables for everything. I come from the days of back in C and and deck Pascal, um, where where globals you just whack everything and hope. hope. Um, but the idea of singletons is that it'd be nice to to have to use new to create memory rather than just have it all uh, around all the time. Um, but I didn't want to create new things that are only one of. And so there's this, this pattern where you take OO coding and you set and you make make a private constructor so that you can't create new versions of it. And then we just create access. Now there are some people who hate the singleton pattern because they see it as an anti because of this idea of lazy instantiation. Um, that it, it, it only it only pops up um, and there's an example. So you you only create the object the first time someone calls for it, so you don't know when things are being created. And this is particularly challenging when you have many singles and you might not know the order in which those singletons are being because like you don't know when they're being so so you you have to program in quite a different way. You have to be very protective of those singletons. Uh, it also can create threading issues when when there is multiple threads running. If two threads simultaneously create a, a single set, then you've got a kind of competition as to like, do I do um, do I use locks? Uh, do I use mutexes to prevent singletons trying to be created at the same time? And, and all of that additional complexity of this idea of oh, I need to I, I don't I don't want to create it, so it need it. Uh, the other option is well, actually, at the start of program, when when the person first starts running your program, you've probably got the most time to do things because you know they're going to have a loading screen, they're going to have the advertising of product on it, and so if it takes an extra tenth of a second or half a second to load all of the singletons in, if you can do that while you've got your logo, people think you're just advertising it, right? Um, or you know it's just part of the program starting. Whereas if you have lazy instant, uh, instantiation of singletons, 
as you're using the program, suddenly you do something, create a memory, and you get a small lockup of the system, and it feels like the system's unresponsive. And that's because it's having to do, in real time, stuff that it could have done much, much earlier, right? And so that's one of, like, is this lazy instantiation only created a good idea? Well, you know, it is if you don't care about performance. But it might be a bad idea if you care about internal performance within the code. Um, so here's some, some instance of singleton code. Um, as you can see here, I, I tend to use longish name. I don't like single letter variables of stuff. I would prefer you to use longer name. Given that you're all using IDEs, um, if you start typing, the IDE will fill in the rest of the word for you. So it's not like it actually costs you anything at all to use um, instance rather than I or um, S is no better than single, right? So, so like just because if you're oh it's past the top, yeah, but you can hit tab and it auto completes. So don't write single letter variable names. Um, I don't want to see that. For for the single letter, you have a checklist. There are examples where you can go and find how to do this. Um, part of the, the advantage of of having know that you will follow in the right process. Um, we have a, a strategy pack. Uh, where you might want um, a part of your code to change its behavior uh, at intervals. And you, you want a, the naive solution is you just parameterize things and use a switch statement to switch. But the strategy pattern says, OK, we're an OO class. Um, we can create virtual classes, and we can create we have instance of those classes. And so when we want things changed, we just change the objects. Right? So again, how, like a, a, a pattern for dealing with how you change the behavior of, pattern, of, of the system rather than just a bunch of switch statements. Um, and you know, there, there, are, there are abstract strategies and you can you create a, a, a virtual class um, and then you create instances of those that, that strategy class, right? So, so I can create a fight strategy and ideal strategy and, and you can create concrete and um, strategies from the abstract strategy. And that's, again, a good standard way of doing it. Um, one of the other standard ways when you do your projects, I want you to think about this, um, again, to, to, um, to take control of your memory management, right? Because um, the, it's quite easy just to go delete. Um, and uh, if, you, if you don't know what you're doing with memory, so we had we had a PhD student who um, one of my colleagues, previous colleague Jason, uh, and Ewart, um, helped. And the PhD student was was uh, doing image processing. And the idea was that they um, they were going to take an image and they were doing an area uh, an area average blur on that image, and going from this image to the blur, um, and they were programming Java. And so you know they they did the the naive thing of um, actually taking the image, and then they took the first pixel and they appended it to an array and they took the second pixel and then did the average and appended that to the array and then the third pixel and they appended that to the array um, because they didn't understand how Java append because Java append certainly you'll get an array at the end but you create massive amounts of memory because each time you append uh, in using the, at the time using Java, what it would do is say, oh, that's bigger than the array I've created so far. I'll create a new space of memory, copy the old content into that, and add your new. And then the next one you add, I'll do this. The next area I'll do in the entire image in time. So every element of the image you would copy all the image up to that point. Uh, and so every time you did processing, the thing would crawl, it would do like one fraction second as it had to create all this memory by appending thing. Um, and so uh, we, J Jason just looked and go, well, first of all, do you want to allocate all that memory straight up, right? And then just edit it as you go rather than create it on, um, on the fly. Uh, and that immediately moved him to several frames per second instead of one frame by just doing a simple memory management line of coach. So um, although it doesn't feel like you should ever have a memory, um, 
it may be useful to still think how, like, who's creating memory, who's destroying, who's in charge of my memory. Uh, and so, again, um, I've got examples of some code. The, uh, part of the reason I put some code in here is I don't expect you to write it down, but it will be in the slides that we give out. And it, it's an example of, a, of an abstract fact and how you do it without using abstract classes and add to it. Um, and the, the, the last pattern um, I was going to talk about um, is the, the the composite pattern. So the composite pattern is this idea that, that uh, when we've got lots of different objects or different types, how do we combine them into a single structure, right? So, um, and the, the idea here is that when you actually make objects, you give them a way of interacting with each other um, that is a, a kind of part and a whole system. So you, so you look at a component system and compose things together. Um, and, you know, it, 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 as, as code, what it does, the graphics example is, is graphics is made up of a drawing and, um, and we, we, yeah, so you can ha have different things like a line drawing and rectangle and text, and text in it and a picture, and a picture can be, again, another whole um, uh, graphic system, so you can you can build a hierarchy and embed things within the set, right? So this idea of that that's the composite. Um, now, rather than than just like knowing all of these and having room, um, the idea is that when you have a room, you should try and see is there a standard way of doing this so that when I fix it, other people will know what I was trying to achieve. And so, visually, you can you can look at those systems as being this kind of um, composite which has some leaf nodes in it and a whole tree structure under um, and And following these patterns, they're, they're good because they help other people understand what you're doing. Um, they can help spot errors. Uh, uh, and particularly if you do unusual code, yeah, usually what we're looking for, um, certainly if, you, if you're getting this, you, um, has been doing a lot of, of programming, they're not sort of looking at your code fresh they're looking at it from a, I've done a lot of programming that looks familiar to me, so I can go in it. And then, you know, when I see a bit of code that, that stands out, say, wait a minute, you do um, That's where I start to look for errors. And so the more stuff that follows a standard way of doing, the faster it is for me to spot we have made them. Um, if you do everything bespoke and you don't look at how anybody does anything else, then it would be harder for me to, or harder for an experienced programmer to have. Um, and, and that idea of, of, of leaving your thought processes to the things that are unique about, um, one of the things that I say has, has changed about uh, programming is that when, when I started being a, um, when I started learning to be a programmer, there weren't a lot of patterns on how you do things. We just started figuring it out as we went. Um, and uh, I, I had to learn how to program if, right? So it was, you know, all the way down to the metal doing program logic rate, and, you know, everything in between. So we, like, and Marish and Runer and, and Dipti, we're all in the same kind. We learned to do everything. We're kind of, I, I use the musician analogy. We're all classically trained musicians. We can compose music, we can read music, we can play all the percussion and all the wind instruments, string instruments. We can program anything that needs to be programmed that can be done. Um, however, what most people now do is they are DJ, right? Most of what you do in your profession, not classical musicianship, where you have to write symphony, it is grabbing chunks of libraries and APIs and mashing it together and trying to get it to sound smooth as you transition from one API into the next API, or you transition from one already implemented system into the new parts of the system you're implementing. And that isn't a full musical job starting from scratch. That's much more like a DJ sampling music, right? Um, and that's where if you start using patterns and you start feeling this, actually, I'm not coming up with new ideas. I'm just combining things for a while. And it's only on the bits that make my program unique that I want to spend the small resource that I have of my time and my attention. 
Um, there are bad things about using pat, and the bad thing is that you can pick the wrong pat, and sometimes you, you'll have more faith in you potentially should have, um, that you say, well, but I'm using the pat, why doesn't it work well? And it's because it might not actually be a good pat for what you're trying to achieve. Um, so just because it worked for someone else in their situation doesn't mean it will work for you in your uh, And we see that when, and I assume a bunch of you have done this, which is we give you a t and you Google it, you find some code, you copy and paste the code, and you see if it can compile, and then you just kind of tinker with it a little bit until it compiles, and you grab the net from a different tutorial and I copy and paste the code, to smash it together to make it work without really thinking about it, right? Um, so at that point, you might be combining different patterns and you might have picked a pattern that doesn't work for the problem you're trying to solve, but works for some other problem, right? And so um, the, the standard one is, is recursive solutions. Um, often they, 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 they treat, um, uh, oh, um, Recursive patterns using the Pascal's triangle. No, what's the the, the numbers out of Pascal's triangle? Um, Fibonacci sequence. So, yeah, the Fibonacci sequence is often used as an example like, of a problem that can solve with recursion. Recursion is a terrible way of doing a Fibonacci. You can do it iteratively and just move. Don't ever have to write recursion. It's just because it's recursively defined, you can make recursion really, really small by using recursion. But it makes it very, very slow by using recursion. So you don't want to use recursion in that case, even though that's the pattern you'd find out. So in that case, the pattern of how to do it is the wrong pattern, because that pattern's not there because it's the best solution to the problem. It's there because that problem is a good way of explaining the solution, right? So we've got it kind of backwards in some cases. And so, so that's what we want you to think about when you're programming. Am I programming this because what I'm doing is the best way of solving this problem? Or is it just the first one I found? Or is it the, that it's a piece of tutorial code that someone's trying to teach something in, and so I've just whacked in here because you know it seemed to be somewhat like the solution. So we want you to be able to reflect about, think about when you're reusing things. Are you reusing them the right way or potentially not? So um, I had finished up there with seven minutes for any questions um, or for a chance for you guys to prepare for your code reviews and retrospect. So, do you have any questions about that stuff? No questions? I see Bruna hanging out with that. <laughs> Hi Bruna. <laughs> No questions. What did Simon talk about? <laughs> okay, well, um, I, <coughs> I'm testing the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Were they awake at all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the lag is still a bit long. There's a tiny bit there. There is still a bit of lagging. Um, yeah. But no, so the, the idea is while you, we do want to see your code, we want you to be coding in, basically in public. We want you to code in front of us so that we can help you. If you code secretly um, and, and try and hide stuff from us, uh, one, Git tells us when you were working and when you made commit. So, you know, um, it's, it becomes harder to say, oh no, I work consistently during the entire two week period when all of the commits come in a flurry uh, on the Thursday night before the Friday um, deadline. Or Tuesday night, well, yes, Tuesday at 3 a.m. in the morning before the Tuesday 10 o'clock. Um, re retrospective. We, we can see that happen, right? Um, and we need to have an agreement basically between us and you that. We recognize that sometimes that will happen and that we will not be overly judgmental of you for that. We will try and help you make that not happen, right? Uh, not that you should try and hide it from us so it doesn't, so it just looks like we've solved the problem. 
We want to actually make you better at programming. And so one, the only really way to do that, to let us in and show us what you're currently doing so that we can help you with process. Uh, and that requires honesty and openness from you as developer. Um, it's one of those very hard, it's one of the hardest traits to develop is the, that, that willingness to share early before you're ready for other people to see the, the code you've written. Right? Um, but it's one of those skills that you do need to develop. You need to, you're going to work professionally in groups um, because your boss will want to see code. Um, sometimes people will leave a project half through. And so the more professional you are, the less debt you leave up, better you are as a program. Uh, and, the, yeah, and, and therefore, the more likely you are for people who want you to work. We have, we we have, have some, some questions, questions and your screen froze. Ah, oh, my screen froze. <laughs> Uh, right, so what I'll do is I'll close that up and I'll close that down and I will uh, jump to here and turn that there. Uh, that. <coughs> no. <laughs> right. It works, so you can ask. Yeah, yeah so um, in regards to uh, when you are supposed to log annotated code, uh, how do you log that in, for instance, Jira? Well, actually, I, that, that was, I, I only heard. Um, <laughs> did you click my bit down? It's it. Yeah, so uh, the, the question was about annotating code and logging the code in Jira. So how, how you do that? Ah, so what you do is we actually integrate here uh, with an external Bitbucket uh, or GitLab or GitHub. Uh, and technically what I do is I have to set up a webhook from Jira into the other repo, into, into a repo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so what happens is is that actually there's a the, the repo I and the Jira issues have an API uh, and then we marry those together so that when you commit into the repo it then sends those hooks into Jira to update the, the issue right? um, and that's why you need that that name also when you do it and this caught us out for a couple of years in a row um, the because it uses email to marry up user in Jira with user in the repository, mm. if you have a different user, a different email address, even if it's the same username, the different email address, it will sometimes say, oh, we don't know who you are, we can't merge those, the, the, the commits with the issues because you don't line up with your email address. So there were like crazy things like that where we had to, to um, to yeah, change out uh, the people's emails, or everybody had to go through my email address because I made my email address the same, and then I used my token to connect the um, the code repository with the Jira issue tracker, uh, and so everything looked like it was coming. From, well, it was all losing me to integrate, and then them on top of me. So it was kind of quite fragile way of doing it. So. But that, that was a couple of years ago. They've got better at it now. Um, but yeah, no, so the, the idea is that Jira just tracks issues and, you'll, and you either use Bitbucket or GitHub or one of those others to actually track code. And then you use the smart commits to work back and forth between them. Yeah, your, your screen is froze again, Simon. Oh. Yeah, but the, the basic idea is that the repository and the Jira system are linked. And every time you commit, there is a kind of a link to the messages and to the issue tracker of what it links to, and that's the way you're commenting on your code and your changes. So then it's easy to track what was for what purpose and so on. So that's one way of kind of annotating your code by the system. Uh, yeah. Yes? Uh, my question is, uh, while we are using Git, especially the beginners, and I have a hunch that uh, while working on this message project, we won't be having a lot of files. So probably multiple students would be working on one file. 
and the issue that comes up in this process is the code conflicting and merging mm -hmm. and which sometimes takes even more time than actually writing the code so is there any way to avoid this issue did, did you hear it sam um so uh more um and merging and merge comps is often most of the work yeah and then the answer is how uh, are you get other tricks to doing that better so that your, your question is how to avoid the merged conflicts uh, well uh, obviously we are going to face a situation in which we have to merge the codes that's right this is actually inevitable that's right but is it possible that we face this situation as less as possible that's right yes so how how to minimize it yeah yeah okay so um there's a couple of ways you can minimize um one of the ways that we we minimize it is um to uh what we do is is, is if you're using um seam file you can actually back things into the components so you actually have different files so you're working on a separate file quite clean um another way is is you make a relatively clear division as to the responsibilities right so so individuals are responsible for large chunks of the code and only they touch them um using a vic merge algorithm uh, or something like that uh, to make make choosing whose uh, file to use faster that can help um uh, if we having uh that how this goes um a tricky fight we someone will say and uh, they want the the curly brace at the top and the up bottom and they keep moving where that is it creates a whole bunch of big conflicts because they they change all the lines of code right so if you've got uh, an id that turns tabs to spaces space tabs suddenly you get massive move conflicts and it's not meaningful it's just spaces um so i i often try and avoid uh, having those differences and i um i think you also need to um look at issues and who's in to make sure that we can i i know that i'm doing an issue here you Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you screen uh, froze again. I, I took some notes, uh, so the all of were great, great suggestions. Anything to add, Runa, or DT? How to prevent merge conflicts? I think it's partly overlapping with the integrated idea. I mean, who could do very frequently? Yeah. You don't have these massive updates. Yeah. Then you, first of all, there's more risk of having serious conflicts. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, secondly, it takes just more time. If you do small uh, pull downs and, and yeah. merges, then a couple of fixes are easy to do. But you have this massive, then it takes a long time and it feels like it's much more work. So, so make the small chunks and pull down frequently and merge often. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Merge early, merge often. Yeah. Yeah, merge early, merge often. Take And if you need to work on something slightly bigger, then always have a branch, work on your own branch, don't involve other people. Just work alone on that branch, and once you're ready, merge yourself and push it to master. Right? That prevents some of the problems. Yeah. yeah it could be worth uh, mentioning that you should do feature branches, so yeah. that you create one branch per feature and not uh, very big features, they should be separated. That's right. Small. Yeah. So small again, small files, small ch changes, small features. Keep it small, manageable, easy to track. Yeah. Decompose larger things into smaller things. That will prevent problems in general on all levels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, any other questions or comments? Cool. Yeah, uh, I think we're good. Now see bit Thank you for me. Uh, <laughs> so you guys have um, and hopefully retrospectives go well. Uh, I won't hang around if you need to I'll try and get to bed because I do have another lecture tomorrow uh, <laughs> meeting. So lovely to see you all. Yeah. Thank, uh, um, thank, thank you, Simon. Simon. Hopefully that was interesting. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, so thank, thank you very much. much. Have a good night. See you guys. Bye bye. bye. Thanks. Where's my mouse? <laughs>